I think we are now in a moment where, a new moment perhaps, where there's a feeling of urgency like there wasn't when I wrote Ministry for the Future in 2019. We're looking over back to an earlier geological era almost, back, looking back then, and now we're in a new one. This is something out of uh, Gramsci, that the older order, uh, what you might call neoliberal capitalism, has collapsed under its own weight and its own crimes and inequalities, but the new, a new order has not come yet to take its place. And we're in that interregnum. If you're here, you probably already know something about them. He's authored over 20 novels and is regarded by many as one of the greatest living writers of science fiction. Having won all the major awards in the genre, some of them numerous times. In 2008, he was named a hero of the environment by Time magazine, and more recently, his novel Ministry for the Future has become a global sensation and a national bestseller, making it onto Barack Obama's best books of 2020 list. He received his PhD in English from the University of California, San Diego, writing a thesis on the novels of sci-fi legend Arthur C. Clarke. Also, he has an asteroid named after him. A story I would like to hear. Climate change has many problems, environmental, economic, technological, political, and on and on. We're going to need great engineers, great scientists, and great political leadership to deal with it. But we'll also need great storytellers to help us make sense of the blooming, buzzing confusion of the world. The scholar of mythology, Joseph Campbell, wrote, myth is public dream, dream is private myth. Many of the dreams that populate our popular imagination are nightmares. From pandemics to climate change to artificial intelligence, there's often a dark, apocalyptic, end times tilt to both our political discourse and what you might call our popular mythologies. There's a reason the zombie is such a common figure in popular culture. You don't often come across hopeful stories about the future in general, or climate in particular. But one of the hallmarks of Stan's work has been to develop utopian visions that grapple with the technological, economic, and political realities. There's a decent cost to be made, case to be made, we're moving toward a world in which the story of climate change will more and more become the main plot thread or a main plot thread in the 21st century. Stan's gonna to talk to us tonight about the future of climate, technology, and society. And you could make an argument his talk could have just been called the future. The stories we tell about the future can influence the shape the future takes. We're gonna need lots of practical solutions to manage the climate problem. But we're also gonna need hope and stories that kindle it. And I wanted to close with a quote from Tim Kreider, who writes the following in a New Yorker profile of Robinson. Our culture is adrift between stories right now. The old ones we lived on for thousands of years aren't working anymore. And we haven't come up with the new ones to replace them yet. It's natural for us to see ourselves at history's end point, since so far, we are. But part of science fiction's job is to remind us that it's early yet. We're still a primitive people. The golden age may lie ahead. What Robinson is telling us over and over is that it's not too late. Don't get scared. Don't give up. We're almost there. We can do this. We just have to keep going. Please join me in welcoming Kim Stanley Robinson. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction, and um, thank you, Jim, for hosting me. Um, hi to Tom and Vera. We'll get it a little higher there. How's that working back at the back? Great. Um, yes, I'm going to talk. I mean, the title, what was it? Climate, Technology, Society, the Future, and Everything. And also the future of the university. Let's not forget that. Um, a little overwhelming, but that's all right. That's sort of um, 
where we are now when we try to talk about any one part of the situation, all the rest of them get uh, pulled into it as well. So I'll talk um, about what I've been learning since the Ministry for the Future came out with an attempt to make that the through line for these other reflections. Um, since World War II, the social scientists have identified what they call the Great Acceleration because everything that we measure has been accelerating since World War II. Human population, um, the pollution of the natural world, the extinction rate, and really everything such that this term out of the social sciences is a good one to give us a sense of why things feel the way that they do. And I wanna suggest, I'm gonna talk at first a little bit about the speed of change and what it means for us because it's different now than it was when I wrote Ministry for the Future in 2019. And I wanna suggest that there's been an acceleration within the acceleration. Um, and you know those transporter things at the airports where you step onto it and you can feel the jerk forward and then after that you can't and you're used to that new speed. So that when I was young, there was a book called Future Shock. But then we weren't shocked anymore because we got used to that speed. And now I think it's feeling a little shocking again. The, and I would point out and, and things that are obvious to all of us, uh, the pandemic primarily, the COVID pandemic hitting in 2020, but also then recently Russia's invasion of Ukraine an actual land war in Europe. Um, the financial crises that have happened not just in 2008 and 2020 with the pandemic, but even just in this last couple of months, and somewhat um, subdued, submerged, but wild things are happening in the financial realm, and you can tell. And then also um, the climate news itself with its consistent drumbeat of disasters and catastrophes, floods and droughts, um, and, and unexpected freezing cold like you all experienced here. Um, and all of these, combined with the most recent developments in um, artificial intelligence, um, it, it, I think we are now in a moment where, a new moment perhaps, where there's a feeling of urgency like there wasn't when I wrote Ministry for the Future in 2019. We're looking over back to an earlier geological era almost, back, looking back then, and now we're in a new one. This is something out of uh, Gramsci, that the older order, um, what you might call neoliberal capitalism, has collapsed under its own weight and its own crimes and inequalities. But the new, a new order has not come yet to take its place. And we're in that interregnum. So of course it feels strange. Now, um, the danger that we're in, in what you might call ecological terms, that's been clarified in recent years like never before. I think it began, uh, if the, if, well, one point along the way that was very important was a paper in Nature magazine by Rockstrom and Stefan and co-authors uh, that was about planetary boundaries, living within Earth's planetary boundaries, and they established um, nine different kinds of biophysical or geophysical parameters that if humanity were to break through them, they could, we could cause a crash in the biophysical system. So it isn't just the carbon dioxide burn into the atmosphere, but also the nitrogen cycle that we've taken over and wrecked. And also the uh, mass extinction event that we have begun and our dependence on the other living creatures on this planet is obvious if you think about it. And there are several others in this influential paper that these planetary boundaries, the reason they are boundaries is that if we crash beyond them, we can create a mass extinction event and a runaway greenhouse effect that could develop such momentum that even if all humanity decided to stop it there, like, okay, now things will admit they're bad, we're gonna stop it, it might have got too much momentum and gone too far to the point where human, human's um, power over the geophysical system is quite limited. There are some places with tipping points, but by and large, um, we are not in control. And if 
a runaway greenhouse effect begins. In other words, the warmer the climate gets, the more CO2 and methane is released from the uh, permafrost in the north, m mostly. And then the more of that there's in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets, and you get a positive feedback loop into a runaway greenhouse effect that we are all too close to starting. And the end point of that is called hothouse earth. Um, and, and Earth has had times in its geological past where there was no ice on this planet. And therefore, we might be in that situation underwater even here. I'm not certain how high Boston College is compared to Boston, but um, sea level in theory could be 260 feet higher than it is now. That isn't likely to happen because there's so much ice in Antarctica that's quite stable, but other kinds of catastrophes could happen. So these planetary boundaries are not negotiable like the usual political settlements that we make with each other as human societies. They're actually hard limits. And we don't want to pass them because we don't want to lose control of the geophysical system that we rely on. And the danger is a mass extinction event. The danger is not the extinction of humanity itself. Humans are uh, too clever, resourceful, and have too strong a technologies to actually run ourselves to extinction of humanity. But we could wreck civilization. And the main driver of that would be food shortages. The moment there's a scare about adequate food, there are eight billion people on this planet. Keeping that system going is a remarkable achievement uh, in cooperation and in high technology that we call agriculture. So um, the um, danger of falling into a social disorder followed by a possible crash of civilization, not our extinction, but certainly our diminution and a, a profound, um, how can you say it, a, a disaster that would be hard to come back from in, in um, uh, socio-psychological terms. So. The, PC, the IPCC reports, and the most recent one is just a month old and is uh, quite um, persuasive. In fact, scientists have these adjectives, uh, suggestive, um, probable, persuasive, compelling, and that's the one that maxes out the scientists' adjectives, compelling. You are compelled to believe it. If you look at the evidence, you are compelled to agree with it. The latest IPCC report is compelling, and only people ignoring it and refusing to hear what it says are capable of denying the news that it's bringing. So that has changed our attitudes, and a lot of things are happening now that are not explicable unless you um, take it on board that we are indeed in a new state of knowledge about the danger that we're in. People are feeling it. The COVID experience was like a slap in the face to say this is what it could be like, except worse. And so now I see things changing when I do my travels in a way that I want to share with you. And to finish on the speed of change, this comes out of ecology, the speed at which your uh, watershed your environment changes is crucial to whether you can adapt to it or not. So it can be, change can come too fast. An asteroid hits and destroys you know, your biosphere entirely, that's too fast. You can't adapt or evolve or adjust. Um, the neighboring country invades your country. At that point, you're not adapting, you're trying to survive. And so there's change that is too fast for adaptation of living creatures. Then also there's change that's too slow. Um, if you think it's going to happen in 500 years, one time I asked a geologist, how fast can the glaciers in, in Antarctica go away and raise civil, uh, civilization? He said, oh, really fast. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, a thousand years. And that to him was really fast. But to the rest of us, not so. And that's the way we have been thinking about climate change. It's not fast enough for us to do anything about it. And that was the attitude, I think, up into quite recently. On the other side of this recent geological divide in our thinking, it was always the next generation's problem or somebody else's problem, certainly the next generation of political leadership, but, or maybe the problem for the young, 
or a problem for the not yet born, but not our problem. And now I don't think that feeling is there anymore. I think we are now in the zone of realizing that it is our problem, and also in the speed of change, the IPCC reports and other findings are showing that we have a decade or two before we have seriously endangered ourselves by way of runaway uh, greenhouse effect. And a decade or two is either really fast, like if you're a geologist, or else it's really slow if you're an ordinary human being trying to make your payments every month. But in any case, it's in a zone that's actionable. We are in the Goldilocks zone, where the speed of change is both extremely dangerous and yet still actionable. And that's what explains several good developments that I'm seeing that I'm going to share with you that have been taught to me, and you've probably seen them too in the news. Um, there are these COP meetings. I saw COP26 in Glasgow. I'll talk a little bit about that later. We finished COP27 in Egypt, and there will be COP28. This, the Paris Agreement, is an amazing achievement. And indeed, if the university is going to be educating um, its students as to the situation in the world, the Paris Agreement ought to be on the reading list. It's only 18 pages long. It's not written in legalese, it's written in diplomatic English, which is a different genre, a different style, that is more comprehensible than legalese. And it's an easy document to understand, and it's extremely impressive, and every country in the world signed off on it in 2015. If I had written it as a science fiction story, it would have been another Robinsonian utopian impossibility. But in fact, it really happened in the real world in 2015, and since then, one aspect of it, two aspects worth noting. It's consensus. Every statement that comes out at the end of every COP has to be signed off on by every nation. Now that makes it cumbersome, cautious, slow, even sometimes timid, but it also has immense power because every nation has signed off on it and is part of the statement itself. They've modified it, they've had their say. It's, there are very few other human institutions that run on a full consensus model but the Paris Agreement does. Another um, aspect of it that's written into it is that every year they have to put out a statement where the promises to do good are ratcheted up. It is a progressive instrument where at the end of every COP, that group of diplomats and representatives from all the nations on Earth have to say, we're going to do even better in this specific way. Um, the one most recently finished, COP27, was a struggle. So they, they have a rhythm of their own, I'm told, by the UN people who run them. And the accomplishment of Egypt that is unusual is that a loss and damage fund was created. And it's so far a bank account that's empty, but it exists as an account. And when money goes into it, then money will be paid out to those nations that are at the sharp end of the stick when it comes to climate change so that losses by way of um, climate damage and, and damages will be compensated so that these nations can rebuild and make themselves more resilient. That was not insignificant, although of course that empty bank account has to be filled somehow, and I'll talk about that more later. Also recently, last year, in Montreal, there was a thing called COP15. This gets a little confusing. It's a different Congress of the parties, and it's the 15th one concerned with a biodiversity treaty, also signed by almost every nation on Earth. And they came out of Montreal, and I want to share that it's rather startling to me that China ran that meeting. It was supposed to be in China, and COVID caused them to delay it a year and then run it in Montreal with the Canadians. But China was in charge, and they, they strong-armed their uh, African client states to sign on because they needed consensus and they wanted it. China wanted it. Um, that 30% of the land surface of the earth is to be saved for the wild creatures of this planet by the year 2030. So it's called 30 by 30. And it uh, builds on an idea by a great um, Boston intellectual, E.O. Wilson, um, one of the greatest of America's public intellectuals ever. He'll be remembered with Ben Franklin and, and uh, William James uh, as a, an important thinker in American history. And he wrote a book called Half Earth 
um, 50 percent of the land left to the wild creatures. And again, when I read this, perhaps 15 years ago, I thought, how utopian, how unlikely. That'll never happen. And now, just a few years later, we're at 30 by 30 and people working on this project. I've met the woman who runs California State Program for California 30 by 30, which predates COP15. And she said, and we all, all of us in this job are thinking about 50 by 50, so that 50% of the land by the year 2050. And California, I can tell you, is at 24% and we'll get to 30%. And this is not a hard and fast wilderness thing. This is a kind of land use designation with some flex in it. So we're not talking about exiling humans from land. We're talking about making sure that the wild creatures are the most comfortable there compared to everywhere else. So. 30 by 30, and that was an accomplishment last year. That's huge and should have been reported as something huge. And, but huge and good in our mediascape is um, not often reported as, as huge as it is because sometimes we can't believe it. Something that good, how could we believe it? We're not that, we're not that smart, we're not that competent, we're not that together. And yet it happened and it has been signed off on. And then just last month, uh, international Ocean Treaty it had been in negotiation for 10 years and different kind of international treaty than the COP systems, but again, um, all of the nations on Earth with coastlines have signed off on it. And that too, 30 by 30 of the oceans and 30% of the oceans left alone, essentially not fished, will mean a rebound in the health of the oceans, uh, um, the life in the oceans that will be um, crucial for uh, dodging the mass extinction event in the oceans. It's not the end of the story there because the chemical composition of the oceans, the acidity of the oceans is a sec and the heat are secondary factors that are quite damaging. But if we leave 30% of it alone and don't fish it, the health of the oceans will come back as well. That also is huge. And again, I think it's happening because of a sense that this is real. These are planetary boundaries that aren't negotiable that are serious and we are responding as an international community. Um, so we need to decarbonize. Well, that's true and we all know this. I won't go on too long about it. But what's interesting is we are decarbonizing in terms of our clean energy production, cleaner transport, cleaner building methods. Um, decarbonization is happening but it's not happening as fast as it needs to to stay under the 1.5 C rise in global average temperature. We're at about 1.1. We're on a course that, although it's um, pretty good compared to where it has been, it's not good enough. And there is resistance to it that's getting stiffer as we get closer. And so we're likely to push through, we're going to have too much CO2 in the atmosphere before we get a handle on it and fully decarbonize. So we're going to have to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And luckily, there are methods for doing that that are not magic and they're not even technological in the sense of being machines like gigantic vacuum cleaners sucking um, CO2 out of the atmosphere and creating a dry ice which we then inject into the ground. Those are possible. Some of those will be built but you would need something bigger than the car industry to suck that much CO2 out in a useful way, and that's an awful lot of factories, machinery, concrete, steel, et cetera. It will, that will be a small part of the project, although there, naturally there's a part of our culture that's fascinated with that because it's big machines. And it's a, and it's a business. You could, and if someone were to pay you, you could suck CO2 out of the atmosphere with essentially a chemical extraction method. I tried this afternoon, but my wife wasn't here to help me, to calculate um, a gigaton is a billion tons. I leave this as an exercise for you all to try to accomplish later. Um, a billion tons of dry ice. I tried to calculate the uh, cub cubic volume of such. What, how big would that thing be? And I was getting remarkable <laughs> numbers that I don't trust. Uh, there were too many zeros, but I, and also cube roots and, um, you know, cubicle as opposed to square. It was all too much for me. I was trying to go fast. And I even asked, uh, you know, chat 
GPT-3, or maybe it was two. Um, you know, how, what's the volumetric capacity of um, a gigaton of dry ice? And, and it was something like, dry ice is carbon dioxide frozen to a certain temperature, and one liter, well, I can tell you this, uh, um, uh, 600, well, I forget. It was like 660 tons for 1,000 liters, and at that point, my brain collapsed. Um, but I put it to you as a problem. That's too much. Nobody wants that much dry ice. There's nothing to do with it but inject it underground, and that's going to be complicated. But we can still decarbonize quite a bit. Um, we are at about 410 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. It, it fluctuates in a seasonal way. Um, we were at 350 um, back when many of us were young, or even 300. We were at 280 when the Industrial Revolution began. And one of the reasons that Bill McKibben called his fine organization 350.org is that the Earth has been fluctuating between 280 parts per million and 350 parts per million back and forth for about a million years back. And it almost certainly has to do with the orbit of the Earth being uh, ra uh, circular and then elliptical on a, on a pattern of its own. And at a certain part of the pattern, you, you get colder and it's 280 parts per million. And then when it's a certain other part of the pattern, it goes up to 350, back and forth, back and forth, like the blade of a saw for the last million years. And we have both the CO2 data and the temperature data matched together. And at 350 parts per million, which we were at, uh, what would it be, back about 1970 or 75, we were doing fine. Getting back to that implies taking out um, a billion tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So, reforestation, yes, of course. You grow trees, it, it, it um, brings carbon down out of the atmosphere and it gets sequestered in the trees. But you would need more land surface than we have uh, to uh, grow that many trees. Then, uh, this is news to me, but good news, I think, regenerative, regenerative agriculture. We've been doing agriculture in such a way that we've depleted carbon out of the soil. And right now there's many a farm in America that has about 1% carbon by weight in its soil. You can increase that by way of regenerative agriculture to three or 4%, and then it begins to top off. You can't get any more into it. But going from 1% to three or 4% for all of the agricultural fields on Earth, just as a theoretical thing, would be enough carbon drawdown to take all the carbon that's been burned since the Industrial Revolution began and put it back in the ground. So this is an enormous capacity, and it's something that we do and something that we have to do. We have to grow food for the eight billion. It's actually a difficult thing, and to do it while also drawing down carbon will be one of the great technological achievements of our time. And as a sign of hope that so many people are working on this, including American farmers who are interested in getting out from under the contractual stranglehold of companies like Monsanto, who between pesticides and, and uh, patented seeds, patented DNA, um, the American farmer needs a way out, and regenerative agriculture is not only drawing down carbon, but uh, um, liberty from big business. So it's, it's got a lot of hope involved in it. Now, I come to the, well, I don't know what to say about it. How are we going to pay for all this? because we live in a world that is ruled by profit and shareholder value. And that's neoliberal capitalism. You talk about chat GP, GPT-3 being a simpleton. Our economy is a simpleton. It's a simple algorithm. Whatever makes a profit at the end of the quarter, whatever adds to shareholder value, that's rated as good. That's what you fight for. If it happens to create huge injustice, if it happens to immiserate one of every four person on Earth, if it happens to accrue all that wealth up to the top and wreck the biosphere, so what? The algorithm has been fulfilled. So we need a different political economy, and we're in the midst of inventing it. Now, inventing a new economic system when we've only got this decade or two next, it is natural to feel frightened and skeptical. We are in a massive 
set of laws backed by guns. And things run the way they're run. It's a, uh, international trade systems, laws of each country. It's a capitalist world that we live in. So between the nation state, where people are thinking about the value of their own country as being in a zero-sum game with other countries, and capitalism, we've got a very awkwardly bad system for dealing where we are. But it's what we've got, and we have to deal. So I'm going to quote John Maynard Keynes, who I'm becoming more and more fond of, where he said, anything we have to do, we can afford to do. And this was in World War II, and he was finding ways to pay the populace to do the necessary work to win a war. We're in a somewhat similar situation, not as dire as war, because it's not person against person, it's all of us together in a way. And um, Keynesianism is an established system where governments are acknowledged to be the force that governs us instead of being pushed aside and saying that the market should rule and the market knows best and the market this and the market that, this fetishization of the market which marked the neoliberal period and the downgrading of government, a very un-American thing to do. But Reagan was first and foremost in saying government isn't the solution, government is the problem, blah, blah. That's all wrong and past. We govern ourselves even if we give it over to the market, then it's just a different set of laws that have been set in law. And now, going back to Keynes, government stimulates the rest of the economy by paying for the original work that everybody has contributed through th by way of their taxes. So it's the big business that belongs to all of us. And the choices that it makes at the source there are crucial choices for what happens afterwards. So I want to just quickly run through developments in finance. There is a network for greening the financial system, about 90 or 100 central banks around the world. These are fiat money banks, the national bank, have got together to discuss how to green money. You can go to their website. They have a, a, a white paper with nine ways to green money from the source. Very encouraging because now it's being talked about by the central bank, by the central bankers themselves. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has a thing called special drawing rights. And I believe it's been named in such a vague and unsatisfactory way, it took me a hard, long time to memorize it. Special drawing rights, what is that? The International Monetary Fund is going to countries that are in distress and loaning them money with the explicit um, acknowledgement that the money's not going to be paid back. So it's not really a loan. It's money being given out to distressed countries. Almost 500 billion has been given out already. The IMF doesn't really want us to know about this because it would be so shocking to certain sensibilities in this country that we are helping countries in distress. Oh my God. But we are because the International Monetary Fund, like the World Bank, is essentially an American institution or an instrument of American power in the post-war world and it can be used for good as such. Um, the, to go from monetary theory or monetary policy to financial policy, a distinction that many of us don't care about, but this is important. Legislatures can just say, we're gonna spend on these things, like the Biden administration's IRA bill. That was a climate bill named the Inflation Reduction Act for um, disguised purposes because it was too good to be true. Um, that is $380 billion being spent on good climate work, and after that, that money goes into the general economy in what Keynes called a multiplier effect. So it just becomes money like any other money, but in its original um, expenditure, it's been ordered by the government to be doing good green work through private companies. It's not dissimilar to the defense of the nation. Um, the defense industry gets paid by the US government, about a trillion dollars per year, and then that money goes out into the general economy. The nation has said it's important to us to have these defensive instruments in the, in the military. It's also important to us to not have the biosphere crash, and so the IRA bill is similar to that. Government expenditure by legislation, so it isn't just tricky work by the bankers, but actually something that people have voted for and their representatives have voted for. When the IRA bill passed, um, 
the, univer the European Union were dismayed to see that a lot of the um, stipulations in the IRA bill were uh, industrial policy that, that happened to had to happen in America. Suddenly, the free trade internationalism of the neoliberal period is being pushed back against, and the American government was saying, this money has to be spent by, in for American companies. Europeans squawked, and then they did the same thing for Europe. The European Union is also making payments to do good green work in Europe. Um, other good things. Uh, private capital, investment capital, there's a lot of it. The, the big central banks, for instance, in terms of assets, the Chinese central bank has five trillion in assets, the Federal Reserve of the US has four trillion in assets. The private capital that Mark Carney gathered at Glasgow's COP26 to promise to invest greenly was $130 trillion. And that's a good representative of where wealth lies in this world. A lot of it lies in private hands, in a, this infamous 1%, and we, you could even say 10%, and it's still a, a small fraction of humans that are in charge of the private capital of the world. And many of them well-educated and well-intentioned, and it's simply not good for business if the biosphere crashes. So um, private investment, with some guardrails, with some incentives, with some rewards, by way of government could charge into the green sphere in enormous numbers of essentially numbers of dollars as a kind of a, um, an opportunity, an opportunity to continue to make money for the businesses involved. Um, and that's the world we're in, so that is a good sign. And anytime you see somebody talking about risk-adjusted investment, that's code for its climate risk they're talking about. And they're going to invest with climate risk as part of their calculations. It's new. It's good. Um, all of these things together add up to a situation where you could make your living and get paid for drawing carbon down, for doing landscape restoration, for doing regenerative agriculture, for doing good green work. You can make your living at it. That's crucial. It can't be voluntary. It can't be charity. It needs to be a way to make a living. And that's what's evolving. And it's, sometimes it's called carbon quantitative easing. And this is only one aspect of it. But quantitative easing, it happened in 2008, 5 to $10 trillion uh, to get out of the 2008 crash. 15 to $20 trillion when COVID hit in 2020 created by the central banks of the world to um, avoid a depression hitting instantaneously. Um, that altogether, it's now being calculated by these kinds of political economists that if the central banks and the countries of the world, the member states of the Paris Agreement, were um, paying out about $2 trillion a year every year, per year per year, $2 trillion towards green work, we could squeak through this century without a mass extinction event and a breakdown of civilization. So, in, in essence, a deal. Because um, the world economy, the GWP, is about 75 to 80 trillion dollars per year. And that's not even counting the dark pools of financialization where the numbers can go infinite but nobody knows what they mean. In the real economy, 75 to 80 trillion dollars per year, and if you were tacking in two trillion dollars of it, of new money to pay for green projects, it's a deal that we can squeak out with for, to get through the tight spot that we're in, the danger that we're in. Now, I think it's a legitimate question to ask right about now. Is any of this real? This story that I've been telling you? Because a lot of it relies on promises. No, we promise to do this. We'll sign the treaty. The people who sign each one of these COP statements, these diplomats and national representatives at, the, at these meetings, they go home and there are people in their government who are saying, no way. We're not doing that. And there are citizens in those countries going, well, you may have promised that, but you can't make me, and it's a terrible idea. So is it real? It's real as a plan. It's real as international agreements. It's real as international treaties, which sometimes are called binding, although there's no sheriff, there's no 
prison. You can't send Czechoslovakia to prison, or I picked the wrong country, obviously. There are some countries you might want to send to prison immediately. Um, so these are promises. After I finished watching what happened in Glasgow at COP26, I thought, since there's no sheriff and since the, the, these um, nation states back home, there are going to be so many people fighting against these good moves. Is it real at all? Well, promises. I began to think of it that it's kind of like marriage. You say, okay, I'm gonna live with you forever and we're gonna be good to each other. Now that can go right or that can go wrong. It's a promise that you have to live out. And that's where we're at. We are making these international promises to each other as countries, nation states with characters and pasts and histories and populations, different beliefs, different religions, and then we're promising to each other. Well, you either live it out or you don't. It's as real as a promise and at that you have to think to yourself, well, is a promise real? I mean, um, there is such a thing as divorce, etc. But um, it's a way to imagine that this stuff is not trivial. It's not just a surface clutter. In fact, if you're going to think of surfaces and undertoes, if you're at a river mouth, the Charles is a good one. Um, sometimes you'll see an enormous chop on the surface of the water because the wind and the tide are going in different directions and everything. Our social media, our culture in general, has an enormous amount of chop. But where's the current going? And this is, I think, the important way to think of our moment. The current could be going in a direction we'll have to make it happen against opposition. It's a political battle. But the current could be going in a good direction right now in a way that I just didn't see, even in 2019. So, as real as a promise, and it's going to be a fight, and we're going to have to win the political fight over and over again. The battle will never end. It'll be a, a wicked fight over a wicked problem. Uh, and I just want to end by saying that um, in Glasgow, the, my hosts there who invited me simply because of a novel, which is kind of a beautiful gesture, you have to agree, uh, they gave me a red badge so I could go into the negotiating sessions themselves. I didn't know what it meant, and finally one of my hosts said, Stan, do you know what, you, why do you have a red badge? What's a red badge? Well, who invited you? And I had to think, I thought you invited me, the person asking me. So I was deeply um, ignorant, but they told me, I could go into the negotiating sessions with a red badge, don't say anything, don't interrupt them. They're, they're doing serious work, but you can observe. And at that point, I did nothing but that. Because the rest of the COP process, the, the blue zone, the green zone, is like a trade show or like a circus. I mean, it's not, it's not where things are really happening. And in the red zone, what I saw were about 65, 70% young women, by which I mean women in their 30s, maybe 40s. They were lawyers, they were diplomats, and they were arguing over sentences. They were editing. And I loved it, of course, for that very reason. I do that a lot myself. And they were concerned that these sentences come out right, and they had an orderly process. None of them wanted to speak for about more than two minutes at a time. They said what they had to. They turned off their microphone. The red light went to someone else. They were quiet. They were cheerful. They were meticulous. And it was quite beautiful. That was real. So. I will end by saying this, um, especially for you students. Um, when I was young, when I was your age, well, this is going to be this is a horrible introduction, but I'll say this: there were bumper stickers that the bumper stickers read, "The person with the most toys, the person who dies with the most toys wins." That was on bumpers of cars all over the nation, and of course they were being sarcastic, or they weren't. It depends what kind of car you're talking about. Um, but as a statement of the meaninglessness of middle-class American existence in the 1980s, it was a profound statement. The person who dies with the most toys wins. Well, that was a cri de coeur. That was um, a population saying, what is this all for? And I just want to point out that now, given the climate crisis and the extreme danger that we are in, that's not going to go away for. Uh, the rest of our lives, even the youngest person here, 
always going to be living with this. That problem has gone away, the problem of meaning. We have a meaning. We have to get through this century without a mass extinction event. So um, at least one problem has been solved <laughs> in advance of the fact. The existential problem of what does life mean? Well, it means we're trying to work together to get by on this planet and to come into a balance with the, the, the biosphere and the planet that is our one and only home. It's, it's um, something good that you can take out of this quite a, a dangerous and startling situation that we find ourselves in. So I'll leave you with that and Jim will help with the questions and answers. Thank you. So folks, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Chandler uh, is with me. We have two microphones. If people are interested in asking a question, if you can just raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you. And nice, short, succinct questions so that we can fit in as many as possible. And I'll try to have short, succinct answers, too. Who wants to start us off? Here we go. Hi. Uh, you were talking a lot about um, a lot, of, a lot of things that are kind of like top down in terms of like COP 20, 26, 27, uh, green finance. Are there any things that are more like bottom up that have sparked your interest? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, in my novel, because my novel was really about UN agencies and top down stuff, I tried to include quite a few eyewitness accounts of things happening bottom up. And right now, in Israel and in France, you're seeing bottom-up citizen action, mass demonstrations in the street demanding that political leadership uh, do more in those given situations. The intensity of people caring to come out and do that and have, in some senses, in party, in other senses, a massive, angry, on the edge of revolution, I think that changes government policies faster than anything. Um, and so can we get out into the streets and caring about climate change? Well, we saw it in 2016. Washington, D.C. was taken over for women's rights, for science. It happens, and it should happen again. And then there's also the regional and local. And there's many a, a reader of my book who points to chapter 85. I've been taught which chapter it is, because I don't know. Chapter 85 is just a list of small groups around the world doing good work for the environment. It takes about 15 minutes to read that list in the audio book. And people are um, in love with the idea that wherever you live, you can put your shoulder to the wheel. Someone has already got a thing going on that you can join. So between those things, and it, and it scales up and down. Um, the individual, the local, the regional, the state, the country, the world. So yes, let's do it. Next question. I was really struck by your red badge experience. Um, and in the back of my mind, I remember just seeing something a day or two ago. How do we get young people in the US to trust the government enough to become part of it? And then you look at our current cohort that's ruling the country, and I wondered if you could comment. Yeah. In this, um, in contemplating this moment, I did mention the government of the United States as being our company, the one that we're all shareholders in, to try to give it, um, to mess with that dichotomy between business and government as if they're different. As they're both forms of government, they're both kinds of businesses. So I always invoke the great science fiction writer who wrote the greatest American utopian science fiction story ever, um, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. So um, it's the shell that makes it a science fiction story. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the imperative. You have to keep doing it. So 18 words by our great Lincoln. And you know, in the middle of 1863, it wasn't clear that that's what that war was about. He defined it as such in that great 
sentence. So um, I notice that these days there is an of, by, for movement, and they're clearly evoking that sentence. And so government of the people, well, yes, that happens. Government by the people, well, it's representative government. I mean, who are those people? They're pretty rich, etc. And then government for the people, that would be for everybody, not just for the 1% or offshore interests, etc. So of, by, for, a very powerful way. And I think every time one is challenged on this, you have to talk about it as uh, an American virtue, or I don't know, my, my wife was a federal scientist for her entire career for US Geological Survey. I've done stuff with the National Science Foundation. Uh, we get as good a government as we vote in. And so that's, it's on us if it's, if it's crappy government, which it sometimes is. Although it's a tough battle to win when money equals speech to get the word out. And then you have to be talking and you have to see if your speech is more powerful than the millions. But it's worked before. I mean, there's many a California billionaire that has run for governor of California and just lost instantly because money can't buy votes in the end. It's really talking that gets you the votes, hopefully. Next question. I'm going to come to, uh, I can back up a second. Hi there, uh, great presentation. This, uh, I'm curious what your thought is on kind of the role of the private sector. You talked a lot about government. i um, thinking about companies like Tesla, for instance, and the role that they've played in advancing EV technology. So just curious your thoughts. Yeah, um, there is a, um, another Boston economist, William Janeway, who talks, he does the actual economics of how much public expenditures in research and development including DARPA, where this is the place where money can be thrown wildly at the wall to see what sticks, and then private industry takes it, um, takes, picks that up and runs with it. And Tesla is not any exception in that. It's done amazingly good work on cars. SpaceX has done amazingly good work on rocketry. But they were, in both cases, and uh, with all the internet companies, they were um, foundationally set up by publicly supported government-run research facilities. So the dualism is powerful. And I think that, again, Keynes, um, if there might be a better political economy on this earth, and I wouldn't doubt it, we don't have time to invent it and institute it. We need to work with what we've got. So I've been, for an, an old hippie leftist like myself, I'm just saying, Government and business working together and getting it done in the desperate situation we're in. Somebody here? Hi, Stan. Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, uh, I'm a PhD student from Boston College, and uh, we just read your novel on uh, the Ministry of Future um, in Dr. Ming Song's class. Uh, we really like, liked it. And also my question is about the novel itself. So uh, in your novel, we see a lot of, like there are a lot of major changes that are um, propelled by violence. Uh, we see um, abductions, we see threats to uh, government officials, and we see uh, drone attacks on um, domestic uh, or like flights. Uh, so I just want to get your stance on uh, violence and also maybe the necessity of violence in making changes. Thank you. Yeah, that's a hard one. And Ministry for the Future is not clear on this issue. It's a mess like history itself. It doesn't make a clear determination between murder and sabotage in the novel, the scenes of the novel. And it probably should have, but it doesn't. So I always recommend to people uh, how to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andreas Malm, if you want to think about um, breaking things as opposed to violence, which the word violence I'm taught by people who know more should only be applied to hurting other people. So if you break a pipeline, that's not violence. If you hurt someone else even slightly, that's violence. And so I want to say as a pacifist uh, and, and an ordinary middle-class suburban uh, Mr. Malm that I don't believe in violence, and I don't think it works, and I know that this is 
there have been violent revolutions in the past that have swept an old order away and you've had a new order. But so much chaos, so much death, so much resentment, and also so much blowback to the point where did was the negative that came out of that violence worse than whatever positive was imagined. And so in my novel, I have all kinds of things happening that I would say we ought not to do. And I was sort of presenting it as a kind of a warning. If we don't come to grips with climate change now by way of talking about it, um, then we're likely to get people in this world so angry that they want not just justice, but revenge. Because they will have seen their village die and they'll be the sole survivor. That kind of, that kind of anger will be hard to contain. And, and yet I don't think it's useful for forwarding things. And I think that one of the reasons that people have taken up my book is because it's about banking and bureaucrats and the ordinary process of civilization getting us there. And the violence may be incidental because they started working on things too late. And you could argue that we are starting on working on things a little too late and we might have some violence, but one of my teachers at Glasgow, Zaid Alrad Hussein, Jordanian diplomat who's worked all of his career at the UN uh, Human Rights Office, the division that Mary Robinson ran, and w she was the inspiration for my character, Mary Murphy. Uh, well, Zaid said to me, you don't have to be in a plane crash to know that being in a plane crash would be a bad thing. <laughs> So we don't need to go through that violent period. We know it would be bad, and we have to come to grips with it really fast. Hi, so I'm a student from up in Maine at the University of New England, and I have a professor that would always say, I wish I could start again with the knowledge and wisdom that I have now at your age. So what would you say is the best piece of advice that you would give to people our age? Moly. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Well, I am quite elderly compared to many of the people here, not all. Um, um, spend more time outdoors. <laughs> Don't neglect your sports life. Um, this is my truest statement is spend more time outdoors because we are a default indoor people. Um, I came to Boston to go to university and the first winter blew my mind and I left. Stay in Boston. <laughs> Um, you'll get used to the winters and it's good for you here. I, I, I recovered from my error, but I would say um, you're, doing, you're in the right place, you're in the right city, you're doing the right thing. Um, I don't have much more advice than that. Really, the going outdoors, getting out of your um, phones and laptops and screens, out of screen world and even out of rooms, into the outdoors. This is the one thing that I've learned through my own living that I would pass on. It's stupid, but it's true. <laughs> Got my over here, great. great. Thank you. Um, so you've given us these great insights on uh, environmental issues, but uh, you largely consider yourself a science fiction author. Uh, and I was just wondering if you see yourself as doing a kind of environmental lit and if so, do you think that science fiction and environmental lit are innately linked? Or do you think you could articulate maybe what the key of that overlap might be? Yes, and thank you for that. I am a science fiction writer, and I am proud to declare that I am an American science fiction writer. And um, there were times when I was young that this was a mm, genre that was looked down upon by serious people. And I want to say that I was right to love science fiction when I was young, and they were wrong. We are all, <laughs> we are all in a science fiction write, uh, novel that we are co-writing together. And this is the great acceleration. The future is crashed in on us. All near future science fiction becomes climate fiction because climate change has already begun. So you have to write about what's really coming if you're going to do at least the kind of science fiction I like. Um, it, I want to put it this way. Everybody is a science fiction writer in their own life. You imagine the future and you begin to make plans and you think, especially the young ones here, if I, if I study hard, if I get good grades, if I get a good job, if I meet the right person, I could have a good life. This is your utopian science fiction story that you tell yourself and then you act in the present on that basis. 
And then in the middle of the night, insomnia, certain biochemicals are missing from your brain and you're thinking, um, you know, I got problems and m money, health. Uh, there were serious things to worry about in this world and you can imagine in the, with the wrong, I stopped giving myself any credit for anything I thought between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. for this very reason, that's your dystopia. Things could go wrong, and, and eventually something will go wrong. And so we have a, a, a good ability to stay blind to our own mortality, etc. So when people say, I don't read science fiction, which I wish I had a dime for every time someone had told me that, I would be super rich. Um, but they're making a mistake there because, first of all, it's really fun to read. And secondly, um, they're doing it themselves in their daily thoughts anyway. So why not get into the thick texture of a novel and really enjoy it? Uh, and then lastly, I'd say this. The novel traditionally in the 19th century was about the relationship between the individual and their society and history itself. And science fiction added long ago the planet. So the relationship between the individual, the society, and the planet. So science fiction is perfect for what we need to be concerned with now, because we have a planetary problem. So there's a couple of hands here. Um, thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. And this question actually kind of piggybacks off the last one. So um, I'm so inspired by your speech and your work, and I'm wondering if you have advice for other storytellers and scholars of literature or the humanities. Like, how do we do our work in a way that brings about positive change? Well, I love the canon, and this itself is already a little controversial, but why not? Um, uh, um, the history of literature in English has given us so many beauties that it would be longer than a human lifetime to read even 10% of them. So when you're reading a novel, you're um, time traveling, you're, you're experiencing telepathy, you're in some, someone else's life in a different time and place. It's like magic, but it isn't. It's just fiction. So if you believe in fiction and you go at it, as a reader first, that's for me, I, I read incessantly. And then as a writer, um, I think it's valid to think, what's the reader going to get out of this one? So I don't read horror fiction. I don't get it. I wouldn't read too many more dystopias. The warning has been made. Where's the fun? And in fact, now I think dystopia, when people write it and read it now as a kind of a comfort fiction, at least our life isn't that bad. <laughs> And so um, I would say um, try to give your reader, since they're giving you so much as a writer, which is hours of time and lots of creative imagination, that's a huge gift, you got to give back with a story, dare I say it, poetic justice or um, meaning, something good, and you have to focus on that one way or another. So maybe we'll take two more questions. There's one here. Hi. Um, I teach high school history, right here. I teach high school history, um, particularly a, a survey of modern world history from the Enlightenment until, in theory, today or close to today. But I kind of have an inherited set of like units, things you look at, that I try to break out of, but it's hard, especially in the late 20th century. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, should I scrap what I do at the end and do a climate history unit, like in the last month, let's say? And if so, what would that look like? Yeah, I think you should. Although it, it would be important to skate quickly, and this is Ralph Waldo Emerson, another Boston guy. Skate, he, he might have spoken in this very room. No, not quite. Um, skate fast over thin ice. So um, once you get to the late 20th century, it's so... Um, um, uh, disheartening and confused that the whole period from, I don't know, most of my adult life, you might as well skip it and go right to the present. Because things led up to this by way of the dithering, by way of denial, by way of incomprehension, and by way of other problems. The whole neoliberal period is going to be looked back on as a waste of decades. Well, young people, you might as well come right up and do climate um, you can do the Paris Agreement, you could do um, uh, Planetary Boundaries by Johann Rockström. You can quickly make a syllabus that would orient them to their moment. To end a history class, that would be quite perfect. 
Last question. Hi there. Thank you so much again for being here with us today. Um, so in your talk, you mentioned uh, chat GPT a couple times. I know artificial intelligence is something that's been quite the buzz, generated a lot of anxiety in academia and beyond. Um, so my question is, what role do you see um, artificial intelligence engines generating text or images, as well as um, systems of virtual reality imaging, like um, the metaverse? What role do you see that playing in the future, especially in our relationship to the climate? Well, I'm going to suggest that the metaverse is a kind of a scam. Um, you couldn't do it to the point where you wouldn't know you were in a box. And uh, you could go back to um, Ray Bradbury's famous Fahrenheit 451, which is about books. And all he had were these tiny little black and white TVs to extrapolate from, and he extrapolated the metaverse. The people there are in a room, and people are talking to him, and it's all computer generated. And this is like 1950. And that dream keeps coming up, but why? We already know from our laptops and phones it's not going to be that fun compared to the actual world. Now, artificial intelligence is a different thing, super interesting, but I want to suggest that there's an element of scam in that too, which is in the word intelligence. If you called it rapid computation, then you'd be more accurate, and then it, you wouldn't be as excited about it. And so even the computer people, and I've talked to a lot of them, and some of them are very good on this, and some of them are quite clueless. Uh, they need to have philosophy classes and brain science classes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, artificial general intelligence is their name for uh, some equivalent to human consciousness. A general intelligence would have agency, it would have judgment, it would have things that rapid computation just doesn't have. I have had artificial intelligence narrate entire novels, quite hilarious, I hope I can claim. Um, and indeed, chat GPT, these large language models, are pretty damn good at what they do, which is examining everything that we've ever said or drawn and making a plausible slurry of all the rest of it. Some people call that thought. Other people just call that what? A, a slurry of everything that we've thought before put into a mash that doesn't have any judgment in it. So without judgment, without agency, and, and certain computer scientists are saying to me that you can't make the large language models bigger and bigger and bigger and crunch through to AGI, artificial general intelligence. You'll just get a better large language model that will more and more mimic and maybe even be able to pass the Turing test. And the Turing test, I just want to suggest, is a very low bar. It's not that hard. <laughs> Think about you, some, you're talking to a friend or to your partner. They're talking to you. They're very intent on what they're talking about. And you're thinking about something else. And so you provide your part of the conversation without actually even hearing what they're talking about or what they're talking about. But you can do a perfectly plausible, oh, yeah, that's interesting, or yes, <laughs> tell me more, et cetera, et cetera. The Turing test is a low bar. And soon, these chat functions will perhaps pass it because they have so many other silly human sentences to collect up a new silly sentence. But they will have never exerted any judgment or any, by judgment I mean not aesthetics, aesthetics, ethics, morality. Judgment is crucial. And indeed the brain studies are showing us that um, you can't be decisive without a strong emotional life. So they study stroke victims, they study people who've had brain accidents, they see what part of the brain is working and what isn't. You really need all the brain, but what you really need to be decisive is an emotional life. Well, these models, they're not, they're not even trying for that. So we're gonna have some really great computation. And right now, there are, um, if we get quantum computers, that might get interesting, but it will be um, algorithm in, results out. How good are the human algorithms? And I don't believe in self-educating artificial systems right now. And I, I mean, I'm just an English major, but I, I have good judgment. <laughs>